Okay, we'll get started. It's uh, Jesse Zeman, uh, Executive Director of the BC Wildlife Federation, December 13th, 2022. Uh, looking forward to tonight's webinar. Um, so uh, I think we've been doing these for about a year and a half now. We're currently planning our 2013 schedule, which uh, most of it should be out here before the new year. Uh, looking forward to some really exciting presentations. Uh, tonight's presentation, we'll be having uh, Manuel Soto de Villa, uh, Davila uh, present to us uh, related to aquaculture and salmon. Um, really looking forward to this because there's a, a lot of applications as it relates to wild salmon conservation and monitoring disease in wild salmon. So there's some some um, learning and some opportunities here for us in the world of uh, fish, wildlife, and habitat, and especially wild salmon. Uh, format is similar to all of our other presentations. The presenter will be, you know, if a presentation manual will probably be around 40 minutes. Uh, we'll do Q and A. If you have uh, questions, please post them in the Q&A or on Facebook, on Facebook Live in the comment section, and Philippe will send them my way. I'll kind of aggregate them so that they're all uh, organized thematically and so we don't repeat questions. And uh, we'll ask Manuel um, the questions. And, and uh, of course, he's an expert in one field. He's not a policy maker or a policy setter or a politician. So uh, if you feel your blood pressure rise at some point, uh, again, that's uh, what your MPs are for, engaging them. Uh, his role in talking to us is really about the science and what he's learned and, and how it can be applied um, to the world of sustainability. So with that, uh, I'll just give a quick introduction um, to Manuel. Uh, He's a PhD student supervised by Dr. Brian Dixon at University of Waterloo. He's a marine biologist from Chile, and in 2017, he moved to Newfoundland to pursue a master's in aquaculture sur supervised by Dr. Javier Santander. Uh, in 2019, he was accepted at Waterloo and moved there. Uh, he'll be sharing his research, uh, which was conducted on Quadra Island in BC over the last four years. His research examines the causes of disease susceptibility, physiology, and resistance in triploid salmon and the compensation mechanisms that can ultimately reduce the risk of disease. Additionally, the performance of triploid salmon can be improved by probiotic diet supplementation. His work is focused on determining effects of probiotic supplementation on the immune system of triploid chinook used in aquaculture to prevent high mortalities associated with marine pathogens such as Vibrio angularum, which is a relatively new one for us, not, not what we hear about all the time anyways. Um, to date, the data collected by him and the research group involved in the triploid grant not only represents an important improvement in a species with a high potential for agriculture industry on the North Coast, um, Pacific Coast, but also provides some insights that can contribute to the conservation of this key species in the province of British Columbia. And of course, that's what we are are really keen to hear about and to learn about. So with that, uh, Manuel, if you want to share your presentation, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, can you see it there? Looks perfect. Okay. Yeah, so first, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, that is a, a really nice opportunity for me to show uh, about what we have been doing as a group uh, from three different universities in BC in the last years. Uh, although uh, I know that this is going to be a little bit more associated with aquaculture, uh, I I would like to you uh, I would like you to know that this is also a great opportunity in terms of like understanding a little bit more uh, from the biology perspective about this particular species that is Chinook salmon, which is the one that we have been studying in the last years. Uh, so the title of my presentation is the utilization of probiotics for disease prevention in Chinook salmon aquaculture. Uh, and as uh, uh, Jesse mentioned, it, I've been doing this uh, while I've been doing my PhD at University of Waterloo. So a uh, brief outline of what I'm going to be showing today. It's going to be focused into aquaculture at the beginning. Uh, uh, in terms of like growth, distribution and projections for aquaculture. And then I will move uh, more specific in what's happening today in Canada. Uh, in terms of like distribution and the species that has been utilized for aquaculture here uh, and the potential of diversification uh, in the different like uh, in, in the Pacific and Atlantic side. And also uh, I will emphasize why we think that Chinook salmon can be 
a great alternative for diversify the aquaculture, but it's important also to understand what are going to be the advantage and disadvantage uh, if this happens. Uh, then I will uh, start talking a little bit more about probiotics, which is uh, the main scope of my thesis. Uh, these are a great alternative to antibiotics. So again, I will present, uh, I will show you a little bit about the definitions and the mode of like action for the probiotics. And then I will go uh, briefly uh, general, but show a little bit what are the results we have so far uh, from our studies. And finally, the conclusions. So uh, if you see here, like world feature is an aquaculture. Uh, it's well, aquaculture is one of the fastest growing food production sector in the world. And today it supplies around 50% of total fish uh, available in the market for human consumption. Uh, if you see here in the figure uh, in light blue, you will see that this is uh, representing the capture from fisheries in marine waters. What we see here in the uh, blue color that this is the uh, lower contribution from fisheries that occurs in inland waters. Then uh, on top, we have here the entire like uh, aquaculture production uh, where in pink, you will see that this aquaculture is the one that occurs in marine waters. Uh, and in, let's say that this is red, uh, uh, this is what uh, is the contribution in aquaculture coming from inland waters. Uh, out of this, and in terms of like the importance from, let's say, our side of the world, uh, America, Europe, uh, salmon has become one of the most successful fish fish species in aquaculture. And in Canada, especially, it's the main uh, producer species um, in the world. So here, in terms of like how it's uh, utilized the fish uh, coming out of the aquaculture, well, mostly like out of like, uh, 178.8 million tons, sorry, 177.8 million tons, uh, around 89% of that is actually going towards human consumption. While only around 11% goes towards the something that is non-food, uh, that, that means like is, uh, are not utilized for non, uh, are utilized for non-food products, such as like fish meal and fish oil, which most of that actually goes uh, into the aquaculture production. Uh, so here again, you see in green what is going into human consumption, and in blue uh, what is going to non-food non -food uses. Uh, also, you see in this graph uh, that global consumption of aquatic foods has increased at an average of around three percent sustainably since the, uh, 1961. Uh, that's uh, the red line going here, and to date, it's uh, around uh, the, the consumption of like. Uh, 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 different marine species from humans. Uh, for humans, it's around 20.8 uh, kilograms per capita. While uh, if we see, oh, now if we see here in blue, we will see that the annual world population grows in around 1.6% uh, uh, during the same period. So this uh, it's, um, uh, it's, sorry, I'm having issues here, yeah. There. Uh, so this is mostly to show that actually uh, what is actually increasing uh, from this demand, it's mostly like the consumption uh, in, 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 instead of like uh, the, that we see an increase in the population. If we uh, focus in how to distribute the fisheries and aquaculture worldwide, uh, it is very impressive to see that uh, it's mostly dominated from uh, Asia. Uh, so here at the top, and. Uh, again, it's very impressive to see how much is coming actually from uh, that side of the world. Uh, we will see that it's around 70% of the fishes and aquaculture actually it's occurring in, in the Asian in Asian countries. So here at the top, we just have what's happening actually in China. And you will see that uh, in the last decade, uh, the fisheries uh, represent a high uh, amount of the total production, but also uh, the species that are in the aquaculture of marine uh, waters, and especially the fish that are produced uh, in aquaculture of inland waters. Uh, this is mostly dominated, dominated for, for, for one species, which is common carp, which is very common uh, in the aquaculture of China. And then in second place, we see again Asia, but in this case, we are excluding China. Uh, and again, it's very interesting. It's very, very important to see how actually it's, it's um, in terms of like production in that side of the world. 
compared with the other different continents um, to date. So uh, if we focus in what is important for us, uh, we'll see that in the Americas uh, in the last decades, uh, uh, we represent around like 12% of the, uh, the total fisheries and aquaculture. And here I would like to point out that just a little bit, actually it's uh, uh, represented by the aquaculture production to date. Uh, we have a huge uh, the contribution coming from fisheries. So we, uh, as, as you might know, there's a very important like fisheries in the Atlantic area of Canada, uh, also uh, on top of like, or in the North part of like the Pacific coast, uh, especially in Alaska. Also we have a lot of like uh, fisheries uh, in the coastal areas of uh, Peru and Chile. So that contributes that fisheries are actually the most important uh, uh, source uh, for this uh, particular like uh, graph. And uh, in general, in uh, the aquaculture and fisheries has seen an important increase in the last years. Uh, all of them are set by Europe. And you can see here that in the last decade, has seen an, it has seen an increase in the uh, amount of like uh, fish coming from fisheries. And that's why actually like uh, has decreased uh, its production in general. Now, what are the projections for 2030? Uh, so in the next 10 years, around 10 years, uh, it's that total fisheries and aquaculture will expand. Uh, that is expected and it's expected to be around uh, a 14% growth uh, relative to 2020. Uh, out of this, uh, aquaculture production is expected to increase in around 22% uh, uh, compared with 2020. And importantly, uh, obviously, what's going or what is expected to happen in Canada is that, uh, well, in terms of like production, we're expecting to see around 18% of growth uh, of the total production in the next 10 years, uh, which aquaculture is expected to represent almost uh, half of that increase that we will see by 2030. So, again, that's why it's very important to focus in how that aquaculture is going to be for the following years. So the Canadian fin fish production is located in two main areas. The first one is the Pacific coast, uh, where we conduct our studies uh, in, in the coast of like the uh, British Columbia province. And the other uh, part of the aquaculture is actually focused in, and it's divided in different provinces, uh, such as like the coast of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland and Labrador coming very strong in the last years. Uh, and that uh, accounts for uh, all, almost the other half of the production in, uh, in general in Canada. Uh, but you see here that most of the aquaculture is uh, concentrated in British Columbia. Now, it's very important to mention, and this is the most recent that I was able to get, and this is from 2018, that this distribution can switch a little bit, uh, uh, especially because, uh, uh, well, still this year, uh, around 30% of the total production of BC was shut uh, down uh, because of like uh, the removal of the aquaculture in the Discovery Islands. So since there was almost a third of the total production of BC, uh, it is expected probably that this distribution will change uh, in the next reports. Now, uh, where are the main species in Canadian aquaculture? Well, as you see here, it's mostly dominated by salmon. Uh, there are other species that you can see here in the graph, but it's again mostly dominated by salmon, uh, which is again uh, the main species uh, in aquaculture here. Around 90% it's uh, Atlantic salmon, while other species such as like uh, rainbow trout uh, are also like uh, a, a utilizing aquaculture of inland waters and uh, contain conditions. Uh, but uh, it's a very, very low uh, contribution for other uh, different species, like in this case, some Pacific species, such as like coho salmon and chinook salmon. Uh, for the purpose of this, uh, my thesis, and for this presentation, I will focus in chinook salmon uh, in all the studies that I will show in, and the, the, the different like uh, 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 topics that I will, talk, I, I will be talking after this. Now, a good question that I usually get is like, if we really need aquaculture for Pacific salmon, like uh, it's already again, uh, 
happening with Atlantic salmon, but why will uh, actually need a cobalt for Pacific salmon? And one of the questions might be associated that, well, Pacific salmon stocks are overfished currently. So in 2018, actually, we were reported to be overfished. Uh, that's for different Pacific salmon species, such as like Chinook salmon, coho salmon, sockeye salmon, and chum salmon. So again, are threatened. So that's why uh, aquaculture might be a, an interesting option to uh, don't rely too much in the wild stocks. Uh, the decline of white salmon has the issue and negatively impact uh, the fisheries, uh, the entire industry, also the cultural heritage for indigenous tribes and other marine species that uh, uh, eat this, uh, different like Pacific salmon species, such as like killer whales, uh, or sea others or other kind of species. And currently, and this is uh, uh, information obtained from the Kosewick report, uh, they have reported that uh, around 13 out of like uh, 28 Chinook salmon populations uh, in the BC area are, in, are uh, enlisted as endangered or threatened. So that's very important to consider also uh, in terms of like uh, looking at potential agriculture for this particular species. Let's say that we uh, answered yes in terms of like that we need uh, Pacific salmon aquaculture. Well then, uh, is Chinook salmon a good alternative? Like uh, Chinook salmon represents a low percentage of the Pacific salmon species. Uh, it's very valuable. Uh, I, I've been there like while uh, people is trying to get, you know, this fake Chinook salmon uh, uh, while fishing. Uh, so, it's a it's a price fish uh, and that in the fletch also like the, the the fletch itself is really good so this might be a good alternative uh, to be uh, to diversify the aquaculture. Also, it's a native species for BC. Uh, there's always like you know some advantages for having native species instead of like intrusive species uh, such as like Atlantic salmon is for actually BC aquaculture. Uh, this, as I mentioned before, uh, can help in terms of like conservation or recovery of wild stocks. If we remove some pressure of uh, the demand from either like uh, the people in general uh, or restaurants or things like that, uh, and we rely a little bit more in like uh, Atlantic, uh, sorry, like a uh, Chinook salmon producing aquaculture, that will obviously like remove a little bit the impact uh, that wild stocks are having. And also, uh, as I mentioned too, uh, the flesh quality, it's really good. And actually, uh, this is coming a little bit with, uh, from our industrial partner. Uh, uh, they are getting around 50 to 75% cents uh, per pound uh, premium over uh, the same price that has currently Atlantic salmon in the market. So they are getting a higher price uh, for the same uh, size of fish, or sorry, like the, the same uh, uh, weight uh, of flesh. And uh, one of the good things is that uh, since this is a native species in BC, aquaculture uh, needs to utilize uh, triple fish, and I will go more in detail about this uh, particular like uh, topic uh, in the in the following like, slides. Uh, but the good thing with this is that the escapees, if there's an escapees from the aquaculture, they will not be able to breathe and uh, with the wild uh, fish, and also uh, utilizing free products uh, prevents sexual maturation, which again I will emphasize or, or go more in detail in the next presentation, in the next slides. Now we see a lot of advantage from this one, but the question uh, that I always had actually when I started my uh, thesis and started like going to BC was like, why does uh, production remain at a lower scale? Uh, I'm pretty sure like so far, the, the aquaculture that I was working with was one of the only ones in the surrounding areas. And again, for a really, really nice fish uh, with a very good quality, it's hard to understand why it's not taking the market instead of like an intrusive species of uh, Atlantic sun. And potential answers to this is like the first one in terms of escapees, uh, that they're uh, still having some concerns uh, that uh, the escapees can produce any like a uh, negative impact into the wild stocks. Uh, uh, when having escapees, these represent not only like, you know, that they can breed uh, in case of illegal, we are using diploids, uh, but also can be like some disease transmissions, uh, can alter the habitats, and uh, also they can increase the predation and competition with uh, the, 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 the same species in the rivers. 
And the preventive method to this is actually, as I mentioned before, use triplet fish. So this is done uh, while we have the eggs. Uh, uh, they are tripletized by hydro hydrostatic pressure. Uh, there are other methods, but uh, in, in particular in this uh, fish farm, they utilize this method, as you see there, like a kind of like a French press. Uh, this prevents sexual maturation. So as you can see here, while uh, Chinook salmon goes into metamorphosis, they are you know, preparing to go upstream. Uh, they start like changing a little bit the flesh quality, how they look outside. Uh, and obviously this is not like, you know, they don't look really like nice in terms of like having this in the market. Uh, the quality of the flesh is really uh, decreased because of like, oh, sorry for that, because of like uh, an increase of like fat uh, in the muscle. Uh, so by preventing sexual migration using triploids, also uh, we prevent this, the flesh quality remains like intact and also increase a little bit the time frame where the fish can be harvested. It's not like a very narrow, you know, window and usually also helps to uh, uh, harvest the fish in a bigger size than uh, usually is done when you have diplets. As I mentioned also, these fish are infertile. So once they escape, uh, they cannot breed with uh, wild fish. And finally, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, there's an increase in growth and, high, and a high quality flesh compared with the diploids. Another disadvantage, and in this case, focus in terms of like just the triploids uh, for Chinook salmon, is that the fish uh, often uh, we see, uh, not often, but uh, sometimes we see some like, uh, you know, the form deformities in the fish that are, are obtained. Uh, or also we see, and this, uh, this comes from data that actually we have been collecting during these years, that usually we see, and just focus here for this particular graph in the diploids and triploid fish that are under regular conditions. That means just the regular uh, pellet, uh, the, the fish food. And we see that in the same time, we have a decrease in triplets of around 30 grams. Uh, so this is data coming from around 200 fish for each of the treatment. And we see that the differences are really high for a time of around one year. So obviously this is really bad in terms of like a business. Uh, having a fish that is going to be smaller will impact the uh, outcome in terms of like money at the end, in terms of like production. So obviously we need to find a way to make a uh, triple aquaculture a little bit more interesting for people that will uh, be able to invest uh, on it. Another challenges for triple Chinook salmons, uh, this has been, uh, highly like, observed in, uh, for our industrial partners uh, is that they has an increase, um, well, our, our, another challenge are the disease. So the agricultural production increase uh, the outbreaks of viral fungal, uh, fun uh, fungi, parasitic and bacterial infections. Uh, in this particular study, we focus in Vibrio angularum. This is a native pathogen in BC area. And this is one of actually the nastiest like uh, bacterial infection that fish get once they move, uh, they are moving to salt water production. And one of the interesting things that they have seen uh, when comparing like diploid fish and triploid fish is that triploids high, have a higher susceptibility to disease, uh, which is around 10 to 30% compared with the diploids. And again, in terms of like production, this is very important because having the fish in the water for four years to then uh, cut around 30% uh, just in mortalities, but not accounting uh, predation, not accounting all different like problems that could happen during this time. Uh, this really impacts uh, what is uh, in terms of like production. Uh, now, how important is this particular bacteria? Well, as you see here in the pictures, these are actually fish that were injected with this particular strain or this particular bacteria four days before I took this picture. And you see that just took four days to really create this uh, 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 ulcerations in the fish skin. Uh, and also, as you see here, these are blood samples. And uh, this bacteria in particular has something that is called hemolysis. So it, it really likes to like uh, break uh, the red blood cells to obtain iron to growth. So as you can see here, it's uh, really fast in terms of like lysing of the red blood cells. The fish get very sick and they eventually die after four to five uh, days once they get the infection, after getting the infection. And this just blood how supposed to for normal fish. So again, this was just in a time frame of four days. 
Now, how the industry, and this is industry in general, uh, it's mostly common uh, information out of like what's going on in Atlantic Salmon, uh, but how industry mitigate these issues associated with uh, disease, it's basically the use of antibiotics. Uh, now, here we have two examples of uh, the utilization of probiotics in aquaculture uh, today. Uh, the left side, it's the aquaculture in Norway. So you see in green, this is the biomass or the amount of fish that are produced in this aquaculture up to like 2000, uh, sorry, like 2021. Uh, and here in blue, these parts represent the amount of like antibacterials sold or utilized uh, in, anti in, in the aquaculture or the antibiotics utilized in aquaculture, which has decreased after uh, the European Union start banning uh, the utilization of these uh, because several issues to the environment. So you see Norway, although they are like the main producers of Atlantic salmon and they have a large amount of like fish produced, they barely utilize aquaculture in the uh, antibiotics in the aquaculture industry. Now the right side, and this is uh, a bit embarrassing for me to show you, but this represents Chile. Uh, this is my you know country, and you see here now we have in green this is the biomass production, and almost very 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 similar. Uh, uh, level, well, in this case, we, are, we have around like 500 tons uh, of antibiotics utilized in the industry. Uh, so, sorry for that. Uh, so, if you compare the amount utilized by uh, Norway and you compare the amount of antibiotics utilized for Chile, uh, we have around like 500 more times uh, in Chilean aquaculture to date. Uh, what is the issue with the use of antibiotics? Uh, first, there's, there are, they have seen widely described, uh, these are like antibiotic resistance. Uh, this not only affects the fish, but also uh, this affects like the microbial communities at the bottoms of the net pens. And eventually, uh, because of like large amount of antibiotic has been uh, um, collected from the flesh that we consume, this eventually can impact our own health. Uh, so human consumption uh, can be, uh, uh, at risk by consuming fish coming from uh, 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 aquacultures with a large uh, amount of like antibiotics utilized. Another method to be utilized in uh, aquaculture are the vaccines. Uh, these are more effective. These are actually very effective uh, against like common disease. Uh, but the issue is that their efficacy is variable when you see in different regions for different species and for specific bacterial strains. Uh, in terms of like, and that's for uh, bacterial infections, but for viruses, there are not really like a good available treatment so far. Uh, and uh, uh, they have not been like well developed so far and they're not working really well for viruses. Now here in the picture, this is a brief example to understand uh, how this works. Uh, here we have that, uh, let's say that we have a bacterial infection uh, that is coming into the uh, particular like aquaculture. Uh, there are different strains. So let's say that we have the red strain, the green, and the uh, yellow strain. Uh, we have two available vaccines, one for the uh, red one and one for the green. And the bacterial outbreak results to be uh, the red strain. Now, let's say that we are in two different locations. One of the locations get the vaccine for the green strain. The other location gets the vaccine for the red strain. At the end of the day, this one uh, that actually was uh, infected by the red strains, the fish will not uh, you know, be able to fight against this because the vaccine was not efficient for this. Uh, instead of uh, compared with like, for example, uh, the other like, area that actually the vaccine uh, that was uh, utilized was actually, uh, or matches uh, with the uh, strain that actually uh, occurred in that particular area. So again, that's, uh, a little bit of like an example of when I mentioned that this is or the effect of vaccines a little bit variable depending of like the location, the strains that are affecting actually in agriculture. And this is what is very important to take into account. Now, what are the alternatives today to antibiotics and vaccines? And, and again, in terms of like uh, thinking about like a more sustainable agriculture, uh, this is uh, actually what has been like utilized in the last decade are called uh, immunostimulants and functional feed ingredients. Uh, these are non-toxic, so that's, again, a good thing for aquaculture. They are non-polluting and are efficient biological agents. 
Uh, what kind of anti-immunostimulants and functional feed ingredients we have so far? Well, most of them are polysaccharides, uh, vitamins, medicinal plants, uh, Chinese, Chinese herbs are clearly very important for these uh, particular uh, uh, medicinal plants, uh, prebiotics and probiotics. How they work? Well, they are supplemented into the fish, they reach the gut, once they reach the gut, uh, in terms of like, uh, I, I will focus mostly on probiotics, they can uh, improve, they can stimulate different uh, mechanisms associated with the immune response, with the fish health, and improve obviously at the end the homeostasis. Uh, and as I mentioned, growth, stress tolerance, and enhance of non-specific mechanisms has been widely described when utilizing these different immune stimulants and functional feed ingredients. For my particular thesis, we focus in probiotics. Uh, one of the reasons is that they are like, uh, let's say, shelf available, so it's easier to get them. Uh, our perspective has always been to get an outcome of this grant in terms of like telling the agriculture, please utilize this. This will improve uh, how you are doing uh, the agriculture today. And for that, we need to find a balance because again, having something that is available, but at the same time, it's not expensive or don't make the production too expensive uh, to really make you know uh, this particular product interesting to be utilized uh, by the producers. And what are the probiotics? Well, these are a group of living microorganisms that provide health benefits to hosts uh, when they are administered uh, in appropriate amounts. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about like other variables that can take into account for this. Uh, and they can modulate, and this is more in detail, uh, the microbial community, prevent bacterial disease, uh, uh, and release some repressive molecules uh, to, again, counteract the effect of like different diseases that can be affecting a particular fish species. Now, let's see this uh, a little bit more like simple in terms of like how's the action of probiotics. Let's say that we provide a particular uh, probiotic product here. Uh, this is the inside of the fish, inside the gut. Now the probiotic is going to reach the epithelia uh, uh, of the fish gut. Uh, they're going to help to maintain the epithelial integrity. Also, they are going to improve a little bit tight junction molecules and increase the mu mucus production. That is very important to fight against uh, different pathogens. They will uh, increase the immune modulation uh, to prepare the fish in case of like uh, potential like uh, pathogen going into the system. They are going to also modulate uh, the microbiota. They are going to interact with the bacteria that are already colonizing our, uh, the, the fish gut and uh, improve how they are doing so far. And in terms of like direct effects uh, against uh, a particular pathogen, in this case, Vibrium gilaru, they are direct antagonists uh, because they compete for addition sites. So probiotics are bacteria or, or uh, other kind of like species, can be yeast, uh, can be some microalgae. So what they're going to do is like colonize uh, the epithelia, uh, making that the bacteria uh, and the, the, the bacterial pathogen will not be able to adhere into the epithelia. So they compete by addition sites. At the same time, they compete by nutrition, so, sorry, by nutrients. So uh, again, both uh, are going to need them. So products are hopefully uh, win this one and, and uh, improve the, the, the gut health. And finally, they are going to suppress some viral genes that are going to be abrogated by the, the bacterial pathogen when it's going inside the fish. Uh, this will, in general, improve intestinal viral function. And at the end, we expect uh, better nutrition in the fish. Uh, and we're interested in seeing that there's an improvement in disease resistance and also in terms of the growth that is very important for us too. Now, current knowledge uh, uh, about probiotics is uh, mostly uh, coming from what has been done in terrestrial uh, species. So we have human, pigs, uh, uh, chicken, and cow. And in terms of fish, most of the studies has focused uh, in determining uh, the effect of probiotics in these two species, the most important, of course, rainbow trout and Atlantic salmon. But there's, and to our knowledge at least, there's almost nothing associated with what happened in the interaction with probiotics and Chinook salmon. Uh, to date, and that's what we're doing so far. So that's why the main objective of my uh, thesis has been to determine if probiotic strains uh, can, can be used to improve triple salmon growth and immune response. 
Where this has been done, uh, the site location is in Quadro Island. Uh, we are uh, working with an aquaculture called Yellow Island Aquaculture. And these are the conditions that we had been utilized. Uh, this uh, contain conditions in hatchery for our studies in fresh water. And then we had the nice chance to have our studies also located in salt water uh, while the fish are uh, kept under uh, uh, industrial conditions, like actual uh, actually how supposed to be aquaculture for this particular species. So what we have done, a uh, brief overview of what we, has been, we have been doing during these four years of studies. Uh, in 2019, we started with one probiotic, uh, Jameson probiotic. Uh, this was in fresh water. And then we utilized this same uh, probiotic for our salt water study. Uh, fresh water studies, usually uh, we utilize fish around 10 to 20 grams. And for salt water studies, we start with fish around 20 to 30 grams, but we ended uh, with fish around 80 to 120 grams. Then in 2020, for fresh water, uh, we tested four different uh, products, uh, different strains uh, compared with like 2019. And then we took the two best, uh, I'm going to show you why we selected these particular ones, uh, and we utilized them as a mix for our salt water in 2021. At the same time, we utilize again these two products as a mix uh, for freshwater uh, studies in 2021. And finally, this year, uh, during August, uh, we utilize again this uh, mix of probiotics uh, for salt water study. But in this case, we improve a little bit uh, the coating, which is actually the compound that is utilized to encapsulate the fish pellet with the probiotic in a way that can be like uh, 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 provided to the fish in normal conditions and hopefully don't be lost in the environment, but reach the gut and pro uh, provide the functions that were expected. So in 2019 uh, study, uh, this is the freshwater study. We tested this particular uh, product uh, first. Well, this was, again, as I mentioned, available uh, in large amounts at lower price. Uh, uh, in this case, we bought this actually in Costco. So again, large amounts and low price. That was one of the scores we were looking to uh, utilize. And also at the same time, uh, this is a the, uh, this is a compound of like 13 different strains, uh, bacteria strains. And that's why we're expecting to see that maybe some of them will have a synergetic effect in uh, improving uh, uh, the aquaculture of this particular uh, triple chin salmon. Now, again, this was the first time uh, going there. Uh, a lot of like learning process during this time, but this was the fresh water study. This was conducted in uh, contained conditions in tanks. And uh, in terms of growth, uh, we didn't see major differences. Uh, I will focus in the last day because again, uh, we would like to see uh, the longer effect of probiotics uh, while they're supplemented again for a long period of time. Uh, but the downside of this study was actually uh, that if you can see here, the blue and the red are diploids and triploid fish actually uh, that we just provide regular diets. And then in green and purple, we have the diploids and triploids that were uh, supplemented with probiotics. What is the issue with this? is that this is the survival of the fish after we infect them with this particular bacterial uh, pathogen. So we're expecting that the survival was going to be higher with uh, for fish that we supplemented the probiotic and not the opposite that we saw in this particular study. So this again wasn't expected. We're expecting to see that the probiotics will improve uh, the survival of this fish. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, a lot of learning process and a lot of like uh, details to change for the next study where we start like utilizing other different strains. Now, that was the freshwater study. Again, we're a little bit like upset, a little bit like, you know, disappointed about the uh, outcome that we had for that particular uh, um, summer uh, research. But then we kept some fish uh, in uh, for salt water. Uh, the fish were already supplemented with this particular probiotic. So usually our uh, studies run from one year to the next one in salt water. Uh, we kept the fish under uh, these probiotic conditions for around a year in salt water, which actually helps to re give a really nice track of what's going on with a particular uh, supplementation. Uh, and in this case, uh, as I mentioned, the fish that were in fresh water, these are like same families of fish, same cohort, but 
but not the same fish that were in uh, our uh, infection study uh, for the freshwater. Uh, but we had some fish that were in regular feed, some fish that were probiotic fed, and then we vaccinate them before moving them into salt water. And then we uh, have some fish that stay with regular feed, so they were never supplemented with probiotics. Then we had some fish that were only supplemented with probiotics during freshwater conditions for four months. So that's why they, they moved to regular conditions or like regular, uh, like just the, the, the pellets. Uh, so they were just four months with probiotics. And then we had some that were regular fed uh, during the fresh water conditions for months. And then they move into uh, a, the net pens with a probiotic treatment. So 10 months under probiotic treatments. And finally, a group that stay all the time with probiotic fed. So they stay for, for around 14 months with probiotic supplementation. After this, they were moved back into the hatchery. Uh, we challenged them with this particular bacteria and we track uh, different conditions for uh, uh, a total of two weeks. So in terms of survival, and this uh, probably is one of the most important things that we have seen so far, is that we have a different pattern compared with what I already showed you in fresh water. So actually we see that fish that were supplemented entirely uh, with the probiotic, uh, in this case, Jameson probiotic, the survival after like being challenged with this particular bacteria was, let's say very close to be 100%, which is amazing uh, comparing with what we saw previously with the freshwater trial. Also, if we compare this one with fish that were never fed actually with the, um, a probiotic, so just regular feed, we see that there's around 10% of difference in terms of survival, which again is really good because as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, they see that the triple fish are actually uh, are a bit, uh, in terms of like 10 to 30% more susceptible uh, to disease compared with diploids. So here we see that we're improving in around 10% the survival of this fish when we are using probiotics for a long, uh, long time. But also it's very interesting to see that fish that were supplemented with probiotics, but in fresh water uh, was actually our higher mortality. So this started like making us think that there's something that occurs in fresh water, uh, this interaction fresh water and probiotic that really is doing something uh, that makes that, uh, you know, we have these differences compared with fish that were supplemented in both conditions, but mostly in salt water. Uh, with the same uh, particular uh, product. So these are promising results, but again, these are the first results we got and there were a lot of improvements to do. So one of them were like uh, the amount of bacteria we're using. So we really like it uh, to see that we push the fish in terms of like infection a little bit more to really see how how high are these differences between supplemented and not supplemented. And also something that we actually changed it for just the last year is the delivery method, which I will show you uh, uh, in the next slides. In terms of growth, we see a lot of variations. We don't really have differences between groups. Uh, and some of the hypotheses of why this happened, uh, remember these are in salt water, so in uh, direct contact with the environment condi environmental conditions. So we feel that one of the first uh, causes can be that the bigger fish, I'm talking about the Chinook salmons, are actually eating more than the smaller fish. Uh, there is a lot of competition between them and that this actually can you know, uh, cover a little bit the effects that we might see between treatments. Uh, also, we have a lot of issues related with or associated with predation. So a lot of like uh, sea otters surrounding the net pens, they push the net pens. Uh, they start like biting the fish. So some of them get sick, uh, some of them get weak, uh, some of them have some different issues. So these two different or these uh, different life factors can also influence what, why we see these uh, variable results among our treatments. And we, again, uh, we're expecting to see that the product source will improve the growth compared with the regular diets. Also, uh, for this year, and I'm not going into details about each of these graphs, but it's uh, just important to mention that during this year, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, obtained samples, we're for first time able to measure these for at least for my thesis. Uh, these are immunoglobulin M, so the and immunoglobulin T, so different antibodies against uh, or that are utilized to fight against disease. Uh, so we're able to optimize the protocol. Uh, and we're able to measure these two antibodies in four different tissues, 
which again, not only represents a good thing for uh, research in general, but also uh, in, in this case, research in aquaculture, but also can be utilized for people working maybe in something more molecular uh, for Chinook salmon in the wild stocks. So some conclusions about this one, uh, and again, the learning process try, uh, where we like really saw that it's important to determine or uh, to see in which stage we are using this particular product uh, and referring to James on providing. So it's not the same uh, if we use this in fresh water than salt water. So a lot of like things to do in, uh, in detail about this. Also time uh, sensitive in terms of like by using the products for a longer term, uh, it seems to be that it's more important than using the product for uh, lower time. And at the same time, it was very interesting to develop new uh, methods and uh, optimize some protocols to measure some uh, additional things for this particular species, which is not easy all the time. So starting 2020, we evaluated another uh, particular product. So in this case, was a bio, uh, was, it's called Biopower. Uh, this is uh, an available product that is utilized uh, in cattle uh, production, in pigs, in chicken. Uh, currently, it's not uh, accepted for a, a fish aquaculture in Canada, but actually it, it's a promising uh, product to be utilized because actually at some point was uh, the only product uh, that was able uh, that that was uh, approved to be utilized in European uh, aquaculture, which again they have a really strong regulation. So uh, saying that this was the only one uh, seems to be that is because uh, it's very important and can create some good uh, you know effects. Uh, what we're expecting to to see also in our production. So we utilize this product. We collaborate with uh, Laleman, which is a uh, producer in Quebec. Uh, producer there in Montreal. We collaborate with them. They were very interested to see uh, how were like the effects of this particular product for salmon uh, to hopefully get this approved for Canada. Uh, we did a study to evaluate the effect of this uh, particular uh, product in the fish. So we had some uh, fish that were injected with the, uh, this particular bacterial species and some fish that were not injected to really see uh, the effect of this providing at gut level. So the scope of this uh, particular trial was to determine if this product uh, first was harmful to the fish, beside any other, you know, variable like ploides, uh, infections. It was mostly to determine if there was any negative effect uh, associated with just utilizing this product by itself. So because of that, it was very important to start each of the treatments with very similar weights. So you see here we had fish around eight grams because all the different things that associated with growth, associated with potential inflammation uh, created by the presence of, uh, of this probiotic, uh, uh, we really need to have this without any other factors that can uh, produce, for example, some kind of inflammation as we usually use something that are pig tags in our fish uh, to keep track of like independent fish. And we really didn't want to utilize that for this particular study. So in terms of weight and length, we tracked this for uh, 10 weeks. Uh, that's a really nice time to see if there's any effect associated with this probiotic in terms of growth. And we didn't see differences associated with the diets. Uh, we don't have differences, even if this is like a regular diet or probiotic supplementation. And since if we compare these two here, but we saw some difference associated with having infection or no, like an injection in this case with the uh, bacteria, uh, which again, is not the main scope for this one, but it's good to see that the injection by itself can create some differences uh, for the results that we have. But just in terms of like seeing some differences associated with the supplementation of this, we didn't see any uh, related to this product. Now, also this study helped a lot and I'm not going into this with this, each of these graphs. These are gene expression of different uh, molecules or different proteins that are in the, gut, uh, in, the, uh, in the interaction of cells from the gut. But we uh, utilized this particular study to really uh, 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 first uh, get this uh, or get the measurements of these particular genes. Uh, in these species, which is really hard, there are very few studies actually associated to these genes uh, that again uh, shows a lot about like how is the uh, integrity of the epithelium in the gut. 
uh, and there are just a few studies actually done in uh, actually in Atlantic salmon. So this was the first time that we are developing these kind of genes uh, for Chinook salmon. And as I mentioned before, for the previous trial, this actually uh, in, this actually increased a lot uh, the different molecular tools that can be utilized not only for aquaculture of Chinook salmon, but also for uh, a, some sorry some biological uh, effects that could happen in the wild stocks. Uh, in terms of histology, also we took some samples, so we are trying to determine uh, with the story, like see more in detail if there's any kind of inflammation associated with the utilization of uh, probiotics or no. Uh, and uh, same with the previous one, this not only helped uh, to us to see that, but also creates a very, very nice baseline uh, to compare uh, uh, what we have here with other studies that can be conducted in natural environments. And also this year we tested other different kind of products. Uh, so we tested four other different like products as you see here. Uh, one of them being the one that I already showed to you. And we see here that actually uh, these uh, two different uh, strains or different products like seed 14 and pedicles were uh, the best ones in terms of survival. If we compare with here, I uh, the regular fed fish, which are in orange. So here uh, we're lucky or we're really happy to see differential effects compared with what we saw in 2018. So actually this was the first time we really had, you know, some options to be utilized for future studies. Now in 2021, 2022 studies, we have been doing some uh, more uh, specific characterizations of different uh, biological things that we like to measure in this particular fish species. Uh, and we're going a little bit more in detail into what's going on directly in the gut. Like we need to remember that once we get the probiotic in the fish or even if we utilize uh, uh, probiotics, for example, mm -hmm. the effects are going to be produced at gut level. So that's why we are trying to go a little bit more in detail of like describing what's going on directly there. So as I mentioned before, we utilize this mix, uh, probiotic mix, uh, which was one of the promising uh, so far that we got for uh, out of like this uh, brand. So, so in the saltwater trial in 2021, uh, we utilized this mix. Uh, we had the fish out there and supplemented between six to eight months. And we observed something that wasn't expected. Uh, as you see here, first we see that the diploid fish uh, under the same conditions, and this is weight and length, were actually the diploids bigger compared with the triplets. Uh, and then if we compare the diploids against the triplets in the other condition, in this case supplemented with probiotics, we have the same issue. Uh, all the time the diploids, as we already saw before, are bigger uh, compared with the triplets. Uh, this is coming from a really nice number of fish that we sampled this time. So we are pretty confident that this was the trend uh, of this particular study. And then we also did with the fish after infection trial, and we found the same, that all the time diploids, in this case, if we combine both different treatments here, are way bigger than the triplets. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that's a little bit like, you know, bad in terms of agricultural production because we would like to see that the tributes actually that are potentially be uh, utilized for agriculture here will be like similar size or even a little bit bigger uh, to really make this agricultural production interesting. Now, what was one of the issues we had this, and usually we have the limitations in terms of space, like again, people from Geloid and agriculture is really nice in terms of like providing some net points for our studies, but it's not that we can use a lot too. So we just had uh, four different net points uh, in duplicates, but the issue was that uh, in the net points we had a mixed fish, diploids and triplets. Uh, it has been observed from different people uh, in our grants, that the behavior from diploids are different from triplets. So diploids seems to be more aggressive. They seems to be they 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 seems to stay at the surface while they are feeding, compared with triplets that are a little bit more shy fish uh, that weighs at the bottom until you know the pellets start going down and then they start eating. So usually uh, they have seen that uh, the diploids actually are going to dominate an environment where they are. In this case, the net pens are going to start eating more compared with the triplets. So the issue with this is that actually we are not able to see 
potentially the effects associated with uh, the probiotics itself, but we're probably getting here an effect associated with ploids. So because of this, the experimental design for 2020 contemplate this issue, and we divide the treatments uh, by ploides. So we had like a net pen that were like triploids for regular treatment, and then we had diploids here, triploids for probiotics, and diploids for probiotics. Also, if you remember the slides from 2018, we improved also the method that we're utilizing for infection because this is a more, it's not like natural, like a, a natural way to get infection, but it's the closest we can go into like having some more natural effects once we are injecting the fish. So in this case, this is called oral gavage. It's a needle with a syringe uh, that the needle has this kind of like little ball at the top sorry, at the tip, and then once it's going inside and we uh, uh, infect them with the bacteria, it's actually not creating any, you know, uh, issues at uh, the gut uh, or the digestive tract that can be a cut or something that will impact, obviously, the process of infection. Now, what is interesting to see, and again, uh, in this case, we divide diploids and triploids uh, by different treatments. This is interesting to see, and here we're going to focus in day 14 because there is the time that we obtained most of the uh, fish that we collected this time. We will see that here in uh, black and white, we have the diploids and triploids from regular treatment. And then we have in blue and uh, orange, the diploids and triploids from probiotic treatment. Now, if you see here, black and blue, these are diploids, and here we have triploids. First, we see immediately that triploids, and especially the ones with probiotics, were way bigger compared with the diploids, which is completely like the opposite that we already saw in 2018. Uh, then we see length, also we see probably not significantly like difference, but we see at least that they became similar in terms of length, the triploids, with the diploids, see a trend uh, of a little bit higher triploids once we are using probiotics. So this is very promising. This is really nice to see because now we really see the effect associated with the particular supplementation and not associated with another factor, such as I mentioned before, uh, diploides. So again, this is very promising. This was like, okay, this really can be the uh, potential outcome that we're getting in terms of like which product to be utilized. Uh, but I will show, I, I will tell you what uh, potentially, uh, or what is the issue with uh, uh, what we obtained this year. The other thing that we're expecting, and this is still ongoing, like we just uh, came back at, at mid-August uh, with the sampling, uh, so, or with the sample, so this is still ongoing. We're going to uh, determine um, uh, or kind of like characterize a little bit better how is the gut of the Chinook salmon for diploids and triploids. Again, diploids being something that can be like utilized for conservation and to be utilized in uh, wild stocks uh, or uh, studies conducted in uh, natural environments. And we're going to characterize three portions of the gut. Uh, these are going to be pyloric, Zika, Mid-Gut, and Hindgut, not only with probiotics, but also we're interested uh, in seeing this in normal conditions just with the pets. Uh, and also we are going to optimize hopefully the amount of genes that we have to really uh, be able to uh, determine what's going on at that level from a like more molecular perspective. So what are, what are the conclusions we have today is that first there's a differential response when having fresh water or salt water conditions. So that's very important to consider while doing these kind of studies. Uh, also, that the effects caused by probiotics uh, seems to be time sensitive. Uh, we only had the chance to test this once. Uh, it will be really nice to test this with the mix of probiotics that we used for the last year, but uh, sadly, it wasn't possible uh, for us. Also, that certain probiotics can improve Chinook salmon survival, uh, not all of the ones that we have been using so far, uh, uh, but at least with Jamison, we we're able to see that the survival was improving around 10%, which is really good. Uh, for our study, sorry. Uh, also that growth, in, growth improvements were hard to determine, a lot of variabil variability, especially when we had the fish uh, in salt water. Uh, and we didn't see that the growth were mostly associated with controls versus treatments, but we see that the growth uh, are mostly like determined by cloids, so diploids and triplets. 
Uh, it's very important also to mention that we have expanded molecular tools and we have optimized a lot of the protocols utilized for Chinook salmon uh, as a species. So again, this is not only from an aquaculture perspective, but if uh, some people here uh, that are doing some research with Chinook salmon is interested with this, we will be happy to collaborate uh, uh, and, and provide these kind of like, you know, molecular biological tools uh, to be utilized for uh, wild salmon. And finally, well, we determined that probably the best probably candidate to be utilized uh, in aquaculture uh, in a range of like, let's say four years uh, was the mix of this seed 14 and biopower. But sadly, uh, the aquaculture that we're collaborating with was actually one of the, the ones that had to like, you know, stop all the salt water production and in Discovery Island. So sadly, we will not be able actually to test this now in aquaculture production for a group of fish for around four years. And what are the next steps? So uh, right now I'm focusing in 2022 20, samples. So a lot of like gene expression histologies. Uh, we're collaborating with Dr. John Lunsden from uh, uh, University of Wales. So he's an expert in uh, salmon uh, histologies. So he's actually providing a lot to his study. And then we are trying to make these stories not only like, uh, you know, evaluating this in different portions of the gut, but also the mind the difference between ploides. Uh, we're trying to increase the gut related genes that we have. Uh, that will be very interesting for following like studies associated with Chinook salmon. And uh, in addition, we are trying to uh, utilize more different proteins that are gut related proteins in LISA. So actually, we already did the contact with a professor. Uh, that has uh, potentially five different proteins to be utilized for our license study. And fi uh, finally, uh, right now, focus also in getting some scientific publications out of this. So we are we hopefully going to get two of these uh, studies like out uh, published. So um, and that will be really nice in terms of finding some insights for this uh, very important species for the Pacific coast. Finally, and this is just to show you that this is not the only thing that we have been doing and how we potentially will impact possibly, uh, positively uh, what uh, we can get out of this study for Chinook salmon in general. Uh, there's an additional study that has been done by uh, uh, Ivan Kalinich. He's a PhD candidate uh, supervisor at Total Portrait at the University of Waterloo. And they have been studying uh, how the temperature actually affects like uh, the Chinook salmon in different ploids. So here we have diploids and triploids. Uh, they have been doing uh, different studies where they start increasing the temperature in tanks where they have the fish uh, divided by ploides. This is just an example of how is the setup for this. The temperature start increasing, ramping up uh, every hour, and then they start measuring if uh, what is the temperature that the fish actually gets agitated. So in this case, once the fish start to show rapid swimming, as was observed here in the video, it's going to be considered agitation, which is here represented in black. And then they also evaluate critical thermal maximum or CT max, which is the temperature when the fish actually uh, lose the equilibrium. So they go to the side and that's considered the maximum temperature that a fish actually can uh, you know, support. Uh, now, the agitation for this study, what they have seen so far is that the triploids in general, the temperature that they need to become agitated, it's lower compared with diploids. Uh, and the city max are uh, pretty much the same, so there are no differences between them. But this in particular is very important because uh, considering that climate change is an issue that uh, probably uh, British Columbia will be facing uh, in the next years, it's very important to consider that if uh, for some reason uh, triple chinook salmon aquaculture gets more, let's say, uh, inter important uh, in that particular area, well, temperature will actually uh, be uh, very stressful conditions uh, for the triple fish that will be potentially utilized in aquaculture. So that's another kind of thing that they are testing. There are more things that they are doing, but this was just to point out that we are getting a lot of information that not only will be useful for aquaculture, but also in this case for like wild fish associated with some climate change stuff. So finally, I would like to acknowledge to my supervisor, Dr. Brian Dixon, here in the picture, uh, some undergraduate that has been helping with this research, uh, all the members of Dixon Lab, uh, also all the members from the Triple Grand Crew, especially to Lona Langlois, which provided a lot of light information that I showed here 
uh, Marie Latimer and Ivan Kalinich, which are from the University of Waterloo, that also help a lot with the uh, study that I showed here. And also universities in Paul, University of Waterloo, Winston and Western, and our industrial partner, uh, Yellow Island Agriculture, and finally the INSERC uh, for uh, providing the uh, financial support for this particular grant. And yeah, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to you know answer. Thanks, Manuel. I, I've got a couple of questions in the hopper here. Um, this rate relates more to the to the to the fish process. We do have a lot of um, in terms of lakes that are stocked here in BC have diploids and triploids uh, that Freshwater Fisheries Society does for uh, angling opportunities. Um, this question is: uh, Is the process of inducing triploids foolproof? In the sense, do you get some fish that are still um, able to? Um, reproduce yeah actually uh that has been tested by an industrial partner like uh triple radiation is not 100 percent uh, successful uh often you see something that are called chimeras uh now it's hard to determine because uh to really do that you need to you know go into more molecular level uh usually what we have or what our one of our partners do uh or one of like people involved in this research do is to test ploidy per tissue, not only like, you know, just one part of the fish, but each of the tissue, like uh, head, kidney, uh, liver, muscle, because in the same fish, you can have some tissues that remain like diploids, other ones that remain, that moves into like triploids. So actually like chimeras, it's something very important to consider. It's not a hundred percent successful method, but they have been doing some studies where they seen that around I'm pretty sure 98, 99% success has been observed. Uh, so yeah, but that's, again, that's very important to consider. Uh, now, in terms of amount, it's minimum, but still something that is that has to be considered uh, while getting this in terms of aquaculture. Okay, thanks. And you did kind of touch on this, but someone asked, are these triploid fish both male and female, or are they all female? Um, uh, these are female. Yeah, these are female, yeah. Okay. So that, that's one actually one of the nice things in terms of aquaculture because female, uh, like uh, the, uh, the male, uh, in terms of like metamorphosis is much more important. So there's a higher decrease in the flesh quality and that's why like having females, but usually also like the size of the fish is a little bit bigger. So that's why awesome. female is a good option. Awesome. Um, are there any other, I'll ask, are there any other questions uh, out there? I'm not sure if there are. Um, there we go. Um, but um, yeah, Manuel, I just want to say thanks for taking the time. I'm sure it's quite late where you are now. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing really late. Uh, we really appreciate it. And especially, you know, as it relates to wild salmon conservation and the future agriculture, obviously, we have members that are really keen on moving to uh, land based um transition so hopefully you know as the research continues to ramp up we can find ways to to help keep our wild fish safe and and uh have a safe industry um where everybody can kind of do their thing and and we can restore some wild salmon so oh it looks like we might have one more here no just some thanks from the people who were attending so really appreciate your time thanks again thanks everyone for tuning in tonight uh and we will see you probably in january Yep. Thank you very much for having me again. And, and, and again, like uh, as I mentioned there, I, I know that there's a lot of focus in terms of agriculture, but the opportunity for doing a better agriculture, I feel that that's, that's very important to consider too. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you very much and uh, best you. of luck in your uh, defense. Thank you very much. Have a good night.